I was going through a rough patch with life. Work and friendships weren't going so well. When I told my brother about it, he told me I should take some time off and go stay with him. That weekend, he was in the Hamptons, spending the summer at his girlfriend's family's summer house. I didn't want to gate crash on the romantic getaway, but my brother said he'd get his girlfriend to invite some of her friends to make it more of a friendly getaway. It was a long drive there, at least seven hours, so I left Friday afternoon right after work. I just wanted to get there as soon as I could and unwind. Little did I know that was never going to happen. It was about 9 o'clock p.m., and I'd been driving for about five hours when my gas light came on. I sighed annoyingly as I hated the hassle of stopping for gas. I was driving through a small town when I spotted a sign for a gas station up ahead. I pulled in and didn't waste any time filling up my tank. It was a typical small town gas station. Four pumps, dim lights, a small building with a flat roof. I swiped my credit card on the island so I could start pumping my gas. Looking around, I could see that no one else was there at first, but then a jeep turned in and stopped at the pump behind me. As I finished filling my tank, a few minutes later, I noticed that the driver hadn't gotten out of the jeep. He was just sitting there with his distant grin on his face. I went inside to grab some snacks for the road and hurried over to my car. That guy was still in his jeep. I unintentionally caught his gaze and gave this awkward nod. He lifted his hand in response. There was just something off about him, the way he was looking at me. I didn't waste any time driving out of there. Then I noticed the jeep start to follow me and turn along the same way. I tried telling myself this was no big deal. He probably changed his mind about getting gas. But 20 minutes later, that jeep was still behind me, even when we came to an intersection. My GPS was telling me to turn onto a small, deserted-looking road, and I was freaked out at the thought of it. I took the road anyway, and the guy in the jeep immediately followed me. Damn it, I muttered. I looked in the rearview mirror and saw him looking at me, that unnerving grin still on his face. I drove on, eager just to get where I needed to be, and was trying to convince myself that this man was weird but harmless when suddenly, at a sharp turn in the road, he began to speed up and started passing me. I slammed my brakes on, horrified that he'd be dumb enough to do this now. On clearing the bend, my heart was pounding, and I was thankful that no car had been coming the other way and I was still alive. I was now behind the jeep, but it hadn't sped off yet. Instead, it slowed down to almost a crawl, going barely 20 miles an hour on a now straight road. I hung back, not trusting the man in the jeep. This whole thing was freaking me out. It's good that I did because, without warning, he swerved his jeep into the middle of the road and stopped there, blocking the road. I slammed on the brakes again and just sat there, clutching my steering wheel, amazed that I hadn't crashed into the side of this maniac's vehicle. Then he stepped out of his jeep and reached over to grab some things off the seat. I soon saw what they were, a baseball bat and a rope. He dangled the bat back and forth in his hands as he walked toward me. He was blocking the road, and unless I ran the fence lining the road, I wasn't getting past him. He was almost at my car now. I didn't know what he intended to do, but I knew I didn't want to find out. So without hesitation, I shifted into reverse and backed up the road, hoping more than anything that no car was coming the other way. I knew that sharp bend from earlier was coming up. There was no way I could risk reversing around that in the dark. Checking he wasn't still behind me, I stopped and turned the car around. It took me several tries, but I managed it. My hands were shaking as I drove. The adrenaline rush was the only thing stopping me from completely panicking. I kept on checking my rearview mirror, terrified that the crazy guy was still following me. Only he wasn't. I eventually reached the same gas station as before. I ran inside and explained to the attendant who rang me up what happened. He called the police and got the Jeep's license plate from the security footage. I never made it to the Hamptons, 
Instead, my brother drove to that small town to meet me and helped calm me down. The police traced the license plate and discovered that the Jeep had been reported stolen that same day. It was never found. I don't know who that deranged man was or why he chose to target me. I've made sure to always take extra precautions when traveling alone, but even all this time later, this was still an encounter that I haven't gotten over. I used to date a girl who lived in Colorado. It was a seven hour drive from where I lived in Nebraska. Being in a long distance relationship was challenging, but I tried to make the trip to see her at least once a month. I usually packed the car the night before, then, as soon as I finished work on Friday, I would drive through the night. Once the rush hour traffic died down, I found that the roads were quiet and there were always long stretches on the journey where I wouldn't see another car for miles. On this particular night, I was reluctant to drive to see my girlfriend. The distance had been taking its toll on our relationship and we'd been arguing a lot. I knew I needed to see her, but to be honest, I wasn't sure if this would be it and I'd be driving back single. The first half of the drive was fine. There was some congestion on the highway, but once that cleared, I hit the gas and soon made up time. Then I hit some quiet roads. I never saw anything in the road, but suddenly I heard a thunderous thud of something hitting my fender, telling me otherwise. I began to panic and hoped there wasn't any damage to my car. At this point, I figured it was an animal, so I stopped the car, took my keys out of the ignition out of force of habit, and walked around to the front of my car. Beneath the glare of my headlights, I saw something that made goosebumps form on my skin. The bumper was covered in fresh blood that also trailed from the road into the surrounding trees. The trail didn't make clean footprints. Whatever I'd hit hadn't walked off into the trees. Rather, they'd either dragged themselves or had been dragged away. I'd stopped as soon as I heard the thump on my bumper and checked it out, so I didn't understand how something injured could have dragged itself out of sight before I could see it. Then I peered down at the blood on the ground and saw something peculiar, something I'd been too distracted by the bloody trail to notice before. Shoe prints. I instantly felt sick. The positioning of them made it look like whoever these shoe prints belonged to had leaned over to grab the thing I'd hit and dragged it into the trees. I stared at the trees and shouted, Hello. Is there anyone there? Do you need any help? When no one replied, I hesitantly took a few steps forward and shouted again. I didn't want to go beyond the trees. Every inch of me was screaming not to go in there. I forced myself to walk over to them and peer through the gaps beneath the branches. The only light was from my headlights and I couldn't see very far. I decided to go back to my car and call one of my buddies from there as he'd know what to do. But as I walked closer to my car, I saw a shadowy figure shuffling in the driver's seat. I instantly froze and asked, who is in my car? I was completely freaked out as I walked closer, but I forced myself to act tough. That's when I saw who was sitting there. It was a man in blood-soaked clothes with red smeared across his face. I didn't need to get any closer to tell it wasn't his blood. He gripped the steering wheel with one hand and tapped the ignition with the other. I felt my keys in my jacket pocket and felt so relieved I'd taken them out. I shouted again, asking him what he wanted, but he ignored me. His attention was on the ignition. I didn't want to risk waiting until the guy snapped, so I walked back toward the trees and called my friend. He told me I was crazy for calling him instead of the police and insisted I stay back and not try to approach that man again. He called the police for me and I did what he said. I stayed and waited. Nothing happened until I saw the flashing lights in the distance. Only then did the guy in my car open the door and walk toward the trees and toward me. I froze in horror, not knowing what to do. Seeing him near me made me realize just how creepy he really looked. He was completely covered in both dried and fresh blood and reeked of death. I took a deep breath and grabbed the closest broken tree branch I could find preparing to defend myself as much as possible from this maniac. Only he took one look at me 
gave this sinister smile, and then walked past me and disappeared among the trees. The police arrived and checked my car. It was covered in blood, and it took a lot of explaining to convince them that I hadn't massacred someone in there. They handcuffed me and led me away into the back of the police car. I watched from the backseat window as they searched the trees, but they never found that guy. They released me later that night, but it took days before they let me have my car back. My friend had to come pick me up. I told my girlfriend what happened. She refused to believe me. My friend told me I was lucky I wasn't injured and that the universe was giving me a sign to end it with my girlfriend, which I did. No way was I driving that route to see her ever again. Anyway, it turns out it was animal blood. I don't know who that creepy guy was, but I'm convinced of two things. One, that he put something in the road so I'd hit it and stop, and two, he fully intended to take my car. I got a phone call from my dad in the early hours of the morning. He told me that my younger sister, Angie, had been in an accident and was in critical condition in the hospital. I immediately got dressed, threw some stuff into a bag, scribbled a quick note telling my roommate what happened, and left. I started the long drive to my hometown in Pennsylvania to be with them. As I drove, all I could think about was my sister, my family, and the guilt I felt for being the only one who had moved so far away. I'd only ever made this drive in the daytime before, so at night, it just felt different. The roads were quiet, especially once I got onto the back roads. Just a few other vehicles and some trucks. When I only had a few hours left to go, I merged onto a stretch of straight roads surrounded by a thick canopy of trees. I hadn't passed another vehicle at all while I'd been on this road. Then, up ahead, I saw something flashing. I slowed down and saw that it was a car with its emergency lights on, completely stopped in the middle of the road. I thought it was strange at this time, especially as they hadn't pulled over to the side. It had just stopped. I don't know why I didn't just drive on. I wanted to get to my sister, but I also didn't want to just drive past someone who may have needed my help. So I stopped behind the car, went, and tapped on the driver's window. I could see someone was in there, but in the dark, with barely any light, I couldn't see them clearly. I didn't want to startle them, so I explained I was checking to see if they were okay. They didn't try to answer me, so I just decided to leave. I walked back to my car, got in, and drove past that other vehicle. Then I called my dad for an update on my sister, and he told me that she'd been upgraded to stable condition. Suddenly, out of nowhere, I heard something coming from within my car. Someone sneezed. My dad immediately said, bless you, but I froze in fear as I eventually managed to sputter out to him that it wasn't me who had just sneezed. Someone else was in the car with me. My dad's tone changed instantly, and he told me to stop the car and get out. I was scared out of my mind as I immediately pulled over to the side of the road. Whoever was in my backseat could have jumped up and done whatever they wanted with me, and I would have been completely helpless. My brain went on autopilot as I instinctively turned off the engine, took the keys, and nearly flew out of my car. After slamming the door shut, I was so terrified that I ran across the road and didn't even think to look back to see who was still in my car. I called the police, then I called my dad back. He stayed on the phone with me and tried to keep me calm until the police got there. I just stood there on the other side of the road, staring at my car. The police arrived, and I felt complete dread as they discovered a woman in the back seat of my car holding a pocket knife. They handcuffed her and took her to the station, but as they walked past me, she looked at me and her mouth curled into a creepy smile. I knew in that moment just how lucky I was that I got out of the car when I did. I figured that woman must have come from that other car when I went to check on the driver and snuck into my car. Maybe that's why the driver had stopped, or maybe it was part of their plan. Guess, I'll never really know. My sister made a full recovery, and I've since moved back to Pennsylvania to be closer to my family. I never drive at night anymore. 
and I only drive alone when I have to. What could have happened to me that night is never far from my mind. I'll always be haunted by what could have been.